Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York and today I wanted to do a little video on the subject of atrial fibrillation uh, entitled Atrial Fibrillation, the Heart-Stomach Connection. Okay. Now, as a result of my videos, I often get the opportunity to talk to hundreds of people who suffer from palpitations. Uh, and most people I speak to either have A, ectopic heartbeats, or B, atrial fibrillation. Okay. Now, when I talk to people who have ectopic heartbeats, the two commonest triggers that I get to hear about are, number one, anxiety, by far and away the commonest, but secondly, a lot of people say to me, when my stomach is bad, when I've got reflux, when I've got indigestion, that's when I get my ectopics. And then I also talk to a lot of people who have atrial fibrillation, particularly those people who have atrial fibrillation which comes and goes, i.e. paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And in those people, when you ask them, what are your triggers? What are the triggers that make your atrial fibrillation come on? Um, and the majority of them will say one of four things, okay? Sleep, exercise, number three, stomach issues. Again, eating after eating, when I'm bloated, when I'm getting reflux, and fourthly, alcohol, okay? So it becomes very interesting as to, it's very interesting to me that so many people describe issues with their stomach as a trigger for both PVCs, ectopic heartbeats, and atrial fibrillation. And therefore, by far one of the commonest questions I get from patients is, why do I get my palpitations when my stomach is bloated, or when I have indigestion, or when I have reflux? Is there a connection? Okay, so I thought I'd go and explore the connection between the stomach and the heart because it's not really well described. A lot of people go to see their doctors and the doctors say, well, I don't think there's any relationship at all. And that's because there's not really much information out there about this. So I thought um, I'd go and do a little um, uh, journey and try and explore what the connection may be. Okay, so the first thing to understand is that both reflux disease and atrial fibrillation are extremely common. Okay, one to two percent of the population have atrial fibrillation, and as you get older, the incidence of atrial fibrillation increases. Now, gastric reflux, GERD, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, is extremely common, extremely common in the Western world. Twenty to forty percent of the population um, in the Western world experience reflux at least once a month. And up to 10% of patients experience reflux on a, at least once a week. Okay, so it may just be one possible, uh, one possibility is that AF is common, reflux is common, and therefore it's not surprising that they occur in the same patient, all right, and sometimes at the same time. So that's one possibility. Um, however, it's also worth knowing that many of the factors that cause atrial fibrillation or predispose patients to atrial fibrillation also predispose patients to having gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. Okay, so obesity. Obesity is a risk factor for atrial fibrillation and obesity causes GERD. Sleep apnea causes AFib and causes GERD. Diabetes causes reflux, causes GERD. And age, increasing age will cause reflux and will cause, um, uh, will cause AF and will cause GERD. So it can be quite difficult to know whether the reflux actually causes atrial fibrillation or whether they simply coexist because they share the same parents, i.e. age, obesity, uh, sleep apnea, diabetes, etc. So that's another thing just to be aware of. In an ideal world, if you want to prove as to whether there's a causative relationship between AFib uh, and uh, between reflux and AFib, what you ideally want is a good study to confirm that relationship. So I wanted to see if there were any large-scale studies that had been done which test the idea that reflux could cause AFib. Okay, in an ideal world what you want is a large study with lots of patients, um, patients who have reflux and who have AFib, where you want to study them by giving them either medications to treat their reflux or a placebo 
and measuring which group has less AF as a consequence. That's what you really need, right? Uh, but unfortunately, there are no such studies, and there are no such studies because they haven't been done. Um, so I couldn't find any single study, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is that there is no link. Just because a study hasn't been done doesn't mean just because you haven't confirmed the 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 the, the association or the causative relationship uh, by a big study doesn't mean that there is no causative relationship. Be simply because if the study hasn't been done, how can you be sure? So I thought I'd decide I decided to look a little bit more in more sort of smaller studies. I delved deeper into the literature to try and find out if there was anything that could help us understand this connection between the stomach and um, um, the heart. Okay, So there was firstly a very interesting study by a guy called Kunz. Okay? And I'll, if you come to my Facebook page, I can put these links up. All right. Um, so Kunz did a retrospective study where he looked at about 160,000 patients. Okay, and he went through their medical records and he found that 5% of these patients suffered from atrial fibrillation and actually 30% of these patients had GERD. Okay, and what he found was that people who had gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD had a 40% increased chance of having AFib. Okay, but this is a retrospective observational study, so you can't be absolutely sure, but it does point to a an association that people who have reflux disease seem to have more atrial fibrillation. Now you may say, well, yeah, but they may they share the same parents. So when he adjusted for common um, comorbidities, he still found that there was a relationship between reflux disease and atrial fibrillation, meaning people who had reflux disease had more atrial fibrillation than people who did not have reflux disease. Okay. So then you have to say, okay, well, that's interesting. Is Are there any studies which have shown that if you treat reflux, the AFib gets better? And there are. So there was a very interesting study by a chap called Vigel. Again, I'll try and put the links up on my Facebook page, um, who found that when 18 patients who had lone AFib, where the AFib came and went, okay, so paroxysmal lone AFib, when they were, they were given acid suppression therapy for their reflux, proton pump inhibitors, for two months, 78% of those patients found that they their AFib got better. So they had less symptoms from their AFib. So that's interesting. The second study was very interesting as well. And this was by a chap called Gerson. And basically, he only studied three patients. But what he did is he measured the pH in their esophagus. So when you have reflux, you know, you, the pH is low. And what he found was that when the pH is low, patients get more AFib. When you treat the pH by giving them acid suppression therapy, they got less AFib, or their symptoms from their AFib got a lot better. So that was, again, another interesting study. And I did find lots of case reports where people who had big hiatus hernias, okay, and hiatus hernias often cause you know, it's basically a little bit of stomach that is herniated into the esophagus, so they do get a lot of reflux. Um, when you treated them or when you operated on the hiatus hernia, the AFib got better. So there are lots of little pointers which suggest that maybe there is a causative relationship between reflux disease and atrial fibrillation, and actually treating the reflux disease seems to get the atrial fibrillation better. But as I say, you have to take these um, data with a, with a little bit of skepticism, simply because they're not like large-scale, properly controlled studies. But they do point to an association, certainly, and probably a causative association. Okay. So overall, I would say that there does appear to be a definite connection between the stomach and the heart, okay? And so then you have to say, well, what are the likely mechanisms? Why is there this relationship? Okay, the heart is the heart, the stomach is the heart. What's the relationship? The first thing to say is that the esophagus, the food pipe, sits really, really close to the left atrium, okay? Um, I do these things called transesophageal echocardiograms, and I actually have to look 
when I want a good picture of the left atrium, I put a camera down the the, the food pipe, the esophagus, to look at the left atrium. And the relation, the distance between the food pipe and the left atrium is only about four or five millimeters. Okay, so they're extremely close together. And it is quite likely that when you have inflammation of the esophagus, you could also potentially irritate the left atrium. And that is one mechanism by which it could trigger atrial fibrillation. Okay, the second thing to say is that Inflammation by itself is a very pro-arrhythmic condition. So any form of inflammation within the body is more likely to cause atrial fibrillation. Okay, If I develop a toe infection, if I develop a chest infection, if I develop a, um, you know, if I develop a urinary infection, I'm much more likely to have atrial fibrillation than if I don't. So just because other... I know that I've mentioned the local effect, but also just because of inflammation, because when you have part of your esophagus which is being burnt by acid, then that is very inflammatory, and that will release inflammatory um, um, cytokines, um, uh, you know, pro-inflammatory mediators into the body, and those can irritate the heart, and that is why... Uh, uh, people could develop ectopics and also atrial fibrillation. The third thing to say is that in those people who have things like hiatus hernias, you may have a compressive effect. So the hiatus hernia could actually bulge and compress on the left atrium, and that could also be another mechanism by which you could trigger both ectopics and atrial fibrillation. And finally, and probably the most likely mechanism, is that the acid in the stomach activates the vagus nerve okay and when you activate the vagus nerve you can trigger trigger what is known as vagal af and well i'll do a video on vagal af hopefully in the next couple of weeks or so uh, but if you want to understand a little bit about the vagus nerve please feel free to watch one of my videos i think i've done a video on the vagus nerve and i've also done a video on the gastrocardiac syndrome so if you get a chance do watch it so those are the various mechanisms by which the stomach and the heart are connected. From what I have read, it definitely seems like there's a very solid connection between the stomach and the heart. And it does seem that A, people with reflux get more AFib. B, treating the reflux seems to get the AFib better. The problem is the treatment for reflux is usually PPIs. And the problem with PPIs is that they have other sorts of side effects, such as because you're taking a PPI, you're suppressing all acid production, and therefore you don't absorb some of the other important nutrients, like magnesium. And that is why one of the best ways, one of the best ways to get this better is weight loss. If you can lose weight, if you can improve your sleep, if you can improve your diet, if you can get regular exercise, your reflux will get better. And with that, your AFib will also get better. So, as always, you know, my recommendations are always lifestyle first uh, but if lifestyle isn't working for you then a trial of proton pump inhibitor therapy may help if you have reflux disease so i hope this was helpful um please um do keep your comments coming uh, i really appreciate them i really appreciate all the lovely words i read everything <laughs> so thank you so much thank you so much for all your support i really really appreciate it and um I look forward to talking to you again in the near future. Just to let you know, if you need to talk to me, you can do so through my website, which is www.yorkcardiology.co.uk. If you'd like to talk to me, you could also do so by joining my Facebook page. Now, I don't know how you get to my Facebook page, but if you type in yorkcardiology at gmail.com, that should take you to my Facebook page. If you go to Facebook and just type yorkcardiology at gmail.com, you should find me. And, uh, you know, I try and be, I try to be as interactive as possible, but my workload sometimes doesn't allow me. But rest assured, I will try and get around to answering everyone in due course. Thank you so much. All the best. Take care. Bye.